will certainly be a lot of job disruption. Um, because what's going to happen is robots will be able to do everything better than us. I'm, inclu I'm including, I mean, all of us. There's like something like 12% of jobs are transport. Transport will be one of the first things to go fully autonomous. But when I say everything, like the robots will be able to do everything. I have exposure to the very, the very most cutting edge um, AI. Um, uh, and I think people should be really concerned about it. Um, I keep sound sounding the alarm bell, but you know, until people see like robots going down the street killing people, like they don't know how to react, you know, because it seems so ethereal. AI is a rare case where I think we need to be proactive in regulation instead of reactive, um, because I think by the time we are reactive in AI regulation, it's too late. AI is a fundamental existential risk for human civilization, and I don't think people fully appreciate. That. If, you, if, if, you're, if you're talking to a d digital superintelligence and can't tell if that is a computer or a human, like let's say you're just having a conversation over a phone or a video conference or something where it lo looks like a person makes all of the right uh, uh, inflections and movements and, and all the small subtleties that constitute a human uh, and uh, talks like a human, makes mistakes like a human, and, and you literally just can't tell, is this, are you video conferencing with a person or, a, or a, an AI? Might as well. Might as well. Be human. So on a darker topic, you've expressed serious concern about existential threats of AI. It's perhaps one of the greatest challenges our civilization faces, but since I would say we're kind of an optimistic descendants of apes, Perhaps we can find several paths of escaping the harm of AI. So if I can give you three options, maybe you can comment which do you think is the most promising. One is scaling up efforts on AI safety and beneficial AI research in, in hope of finding an algorithmic or maybe a policy solution. Two is becoming a multiplanetary species as quickly as possible. And three is merging with AI and, and riding the wave of that increasing intelligence uh, as it continuously improves. What do you think is most promising, most interesting as a civilization that we should invest in? I think there's, there's a, lot, a tremendous amount of investment going on in AI. Where there's a lack of investment is in AI safety. And there should be, in my view, a government agency that oversees anything related to AI to confirm that it is does not represent a public safety risk. Just as there is a regulatory authority for, just like the Food and Drug Administration, there's NHTSA for auto automotive safety, there's the FAA for aircraft safety. We've generally come to the conclusion that it is important to have a government referee or a referee that is serving the public interest in, in ensuring that things are safe when, when there's a potential danger to the public. Um, I would argue that uh, AI is unequivocally uh, something that has potential to be dangerous to the public and therefore should have a regulatory agency just as other things that are dangerous to the public have a regulatory agency. But let me tell you, the problem with this is that the government moves very slowly. Usually the way a regulatory agency comes into being is that something terrible happens. There's a huge public outcry. And years after that, there's a regulatory agency or a rule put in place. Take something like, like seat belts. It was known for I don't know, a decade or more that seat belts would have a massive impact on uh, safety and, and save so many lives and serious injuries. And the car industry fought the requirement to put seat belts in tooth and nail. That's crazy. Yeah. And and I don't know, hundreds of thousands of people probably died because of that. And they said people wouldn't buy cars if they had seat belts which is obviously absurd. You know, or look at the tobacco industry and how long they fought any thing about smoking. That's part of why I helped make that movie, Thank You for Smoking. You can sort of see just how pernicious it can be when you have these companies effectively achieve regulatory capture of, of government, the bad. People in the AI community refer to the advent of digital superintelligence as a singularity. That, that is not to say that it is 
good or bad, but it, that it is very difficult to predict uh, what will happen after that point, and and that there's some probability it will be bad, some probability it will be it will be good. We obviously want to affect that probability and have it be more good than bad. Right now, just the, the data we have regarding how the brain works is is very limited. You know, we've got fMRI, which is that that's kind of like putting a you know a stethoscope on the outside of a factory wall and and then putting it like all over the factory wall and you can sort of hear the sounds, but you don't know what the machines are doing really. No, you, it's hard. You, you can infer a few things, but it's a very broad brushstroke. In order to really know what's going on in the brain, you really need you have to have high precision sensors, and then you want to have stimulus and response. Like if, if you trigger a neuron, what how how do you feel? What do you see? How does it change your perception of the world? I actually think the machine side is far more malleable than the biological side by, by a huge amount. So it will be the, the machine that adapts to the brain. It ha that's the only thing that's possible. The brain can't adapt that well to, to, to the machine. You can't have neurons start to regard an electrode as an, like, another neuron. Because like, neurons just, there's like the pulse. And so something else is pulsing. So, so there's, there is that there is that that elasticity in the interface which we believe is, is something that can can happen but the vast majority of the malleability will have to be on the machine side there will be some adjustment to the brain because there's, there's going to be something reading and simulating the the brain and so it will adjust to to that thing but but most the vast majority of the adjustment will be on the machine side this is just it, this is just it has to be that otherwise it will not work Ultimately, like we, you know, we currently operate on two layers. We have sort of a limbic, like prime primitive brain layer, which is where all of our kind of impulses are, are coming from. It's sort of like we've got we've got like a monkey brain with a computer stuck on it. That's that's the human brain, <laughs> and a lot of our impulses and everything are driven by the monkey brain. And the the computer, the cortex, uh, is constantly trying to make the mon monkey brain happy. It's not the cortex that's steering the monkey brain. It's the monkey brain steering the cortex. The cortex is like what we call like human intelligence. You know, so it's like the, that's like the advanced computer relative to other creatures. Uh, other, other creatures do not have either. Really, they, they don't. They don't have the computer, or they have a very weak computer relative to humans. It, it sort of seems like sh surely the really smart thing should control the dumb thing, but actually, the dumb thing controls the smart thing. I mean, we're a neural net, and, and that you know. AI is basically neural net. So it's like digital neural net will interface with biological neural net. And hopefully bring us along for the ride, you know. But the vast majority of our of, of our of our intelligence will be digital. So like think of like the, the difference in intelligence between your the cortex and your limbic system is gigantic. Your your, your limbic system really has no comprehension of what the hell the cortex is doing. Um, you know, it's just literally hungry, you know, or tired, or angry, or sexy, or something, you know. And, and then it, that communicates that that impulse to the cortex, and tells the cortex to go satisfy that. People generally don't uh, lose the cortex either, right? So they like having the cortex and the limbic system. Yeah. Uh, and and then there's a tertiary layer which will be digital superintelligence, and I, I think there's. Room for optimism, given that the cortex, the, 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 the cortex is very intelligent and the limbic system is not, and yet they work together well. Perhaps there can be a tertiary layer uh, where, where digital superintelligence lies, and that that will be vastly more intelligent than the cortex, but still coexist peacefully and in a benign manner with the cortex and limbic system.